Welcome to this episode of Nature Positivity, the podcast where we chat about all the fun things that happen in the natural world over a cup of tea. I'm Holly. And I'm Keris. And for this quacking episode, we're joined by Jack Wright, aka Jack Birdbrain, on Instagram. Do you have a cup of tea or a hot drink with you? Oh, I have a cold beverage. I have an apple and mango juice. Um, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I don't like tea. Um, I don't know if that's like banned on this podcast. Maybe we can <laughs> name it to the Nature Pozzo Coffee podcast. I think that would be better. But, you know, cold drinks are plenty. You don't like tea, but I don't like coffee. So. Oh, I like both. <laughs> oh, happy medium. Happy medium. Yeah. I mean, a, a mocha is nice. Maybe like a mint tea is like, you know, a bit exciting. But, um, yeah, I'm very un-British in the fact that if I have a cup of tea, I'll have it. But I don't sit there after a long car journey and think, oh, I'd love a copper. No, that's <laughs> not me, unfortunately. Do you have a hot drink, Holly? I have a cup of tea, yes. <laughs> and do you, care? Enjoy your cup of tea. I actually have gone against the podcast and I don't have a cup of tea with me, unfortunately. But I have one in spirit. That's good. That'll do. <laughs> I'm Jack Wright, aka Jack Birdbrain. Uh, I'm an amateur naturalist, even more amateur wildlife photographer. Uh, I am an environmental studies graduate from the University of Kent. Um, I'm a wildlife blogger um, and even a semi-published author, so to speak. Um, I have a short story uh, published in a book. Uh, and guess what? It's about birds. Because um, I am, as the name, as it says in the tin, I am nuts about birds. Honestly, if you talk to me, I will probably start a conversation that will inevitably come up with a random fact about birds, ornithology, bird watching. I'm just a bird nerd, really, and I love it. Nice. <laughs> so I've got a big first question. Do you have a favourite bird? Of course I do. I mean, everyone who has a specialisation in something that they enjoy or that they research, like, oh, this is a difficult question. For me, it's a very easy question. And I have actually worn, guys can't see this, but I've worn a jumper with the bird on it. It is a barn owl, because barn owls are the superior bird, and I will not hear any other any other arguments any other sort of contrary uh, planes of thought i think for me a barn owl is a bird that is just timeless there's not a time where you can see a barn owl and be bored there's never a time where you know seeing a barn owl doesn't at least turn your day from a six out of ten to a ten out of ten you will go away from seeing a barn owl and tell someone they are just magical They've, you know, evoked folklore. They're, you know, a real symbol um, of bird life in the UK. Um, and yeah, you cannot go wrong with a barn owl. Um, that's my that's my pitch for the barn owl. That's a good strong answer. I like that. They they cannot be matched unless you are a vole, to which point they're probably your least favourite bird. <laughs> We're not asking voles, and voles can't listen to this podcast, so it's absolutely fine. Definitely. Do you have a favourite bird, Keris? Oh, I never thought I'd be asked that. I like robins. I feel like that's quite a standard answer, but they're like quite friendly. Oh, I don't know about that. The, oh. the, the general consensus is that robins are actually incredibly violent and incredibly territorial. Oh, <laughs> I mean like around people, they're like... Yeah, I mean they look lovely on, on Christmas cards and, and <laughs> yeah. next to Holly and, and, and on your bird table when they're not. Yeah, exactly trying to fight other robins but that's true no, robins are cute i like robins you can't hate a robin do you have one holly i'm gonna do what you said most people do and say i don't have one in particular but <clears throat> i would choose maybe a couple based on their appearance and also ones i actually i want to see that i've not seen before i want to see a chuff um i really want to see a crossbill and <clears throat> a hoopoo i think they all look very distinct what was the third one a hoopoo I think that's how you say I'm it. with you on Team Hoopoo. Yeah. I've never heard of that. They are a funky Mediterranean bird with a massive bill, a spiky crest, 
but also black and white wings right at the back. They are, you know, like a, a dream, like someone's randomly created a bird out of the air. <laughs> Um, I have only ever seen one once as it was flying away from me in Barcelona, which I don't count that. So I'm still, Hoopoo is still on my list um, and it's very, very high up there. Mm -hmm. One day. <laughs> one day. One day. Okay. Fingers crossed. <laughs> So in case anyone listening doesn't know what is meant by birding, could you explain what the term means? I mean, it's essentially um, just the shortening of, of bird watching. And I think birding is essentially whatever you define it. I don't think there's a, a unitary authority that tells people what birding has to be. Uh, birding could be watching birds in your garden as you've put, you know, feeders out, or it could be going to a nature reserve uh, to specifically look at birds. Um, I think there's two sort of schools of thought on, on how far you can go into birding. You can, you know, do it on the basis of wanting to enjoy a bit of fresh air, a bit of the, the great outdoors, just trying to experience, you know, the seasons um, and, you know, in, enjoy the bounty of nature, so to speak. Uh, there's more kind of elite levels to it, um, such as uh, the twitchers, uh, the people who um, treat it almost like a sport um, in the sense of hearing that there is a rarity 200 miles away um, and dropping everything and traveling to go and find that bird so that they can tick it on their list. So you can you can go into it in various different levels of um, enthusiasm, you can go, you know, you can spend countless amounts of money on different pieces of equipment, um, you know, cameras, binoculars, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But really, to be a birder, you, you don't need to, you know, spend an absolute fortune. If you go out to the park, you know, see a few wood pigeons, maybe see a, a rare bird like a jay or like a nuthatch or something. You, you're, you're birding. Um, so yeah, birding is whatever you, you know, make of it, so to speak. I like that, yeah. Is there anything in particular that you feel got you into birding or like wildlife in general? Well, ever since I was a small boy, <laughs> which is a sentence that everyone says, um, but it is also true. Um, for me, my logic is every human on earth likes animals as much as anyone can deny it it's why you know um, we have pets it's why you know we have terrible tattoos of dolphins and swallows you know from our cereal boxes to our star signs animals are everywhere so when you grow up in the uk and you watch you know david attenborough documentaries of you know wildebeest and lions and you sort of look out your window and you think i want that and you see rabbits you kind of have to manage your expectations so really in the uk the most diverse form of wildlife that there is is bird life and you know as a as a child um, that would be the thing that i would just really set my brain on. I remember probably first going properly birding to a nature reserve, probably when I was about seven. Um, and I remember seeing a little egret, this, you know, beautiful white bird, uh, which at the time was very, very rare, which is showing my age. Um, and subsequently, little egrets are about as common as probably pigeons. I'm now bored of seeing little egrets. So yeah, that really you know, that for me was an early experience. That for me was, you know, a feeling of um, not just enjoying being outside, but ultimately, you know, feeling like I've achieved something. I've seen something rare. I can tick it off a list. I can tell people that I've seen it. So yeah, um, being sort of in the UK, like I said, with a lot of bird life, specifically, I grew up in rural Norfolk, which if anyone who is into their bird watching will tell you Norfolk is probably one of the sort of prime locations to go if you're interested in birds. So I was very lucky in the fact that my local nature reserve was Minsmere, 
the only problem was with it was it set the bar very high when I went to other nature reserves and I didn't find bitterns and marsh harriers every five minutes I was a bit let down um, so yeah it, it was very difficult to avoid birds um, I was very lucky to have a few friends my age who were also into it which really helped but yeah no I mean it's something which is thankfully stuck with me in my tender old age of 27 um, but uh, yeah hopefully it'll, it'll last me longer I feel yeah definitely is there a particular standout moment that you've had when birding maybe there's been a particular species that you've seen too many way too many um i think the ones that stick out to me um the thing about birding is there are two aspects to it one the bird itself and two the context by which you have seen it so for example if you're a, a lake and you see a mute swan fly past, it's pretty standard, it's pretty boring. If you're up the top of Scarfell Pike or you're on Canary Wharf and you see a mute swan fly past, ah, notable, a bit different. Um, one that sticks in my mind was I was in East London. I was by uh, Hackney Wick um, near um, the Olympic Stadium. Very, very built up area, high rise flats. Uh, um, I was by the River Lee, um, and I could hear a load of gulls squawking and flying overhead, and I thought, oh, that's a bit unusual. And then I looked to the sky, and there was an osprey flying over East London, pretty central. And I knew it was an osprey, because I'd seen them before, I'd seen them in Florida, so I definitely knew that it was one. And I distinctly remember a group of elderly walkers sort of turned to me and said, excuse me, what are you looking at? And I turned to look at them, I looked back at the sky, and of course it had gone, and I couldn't find it. And of course these old ladies are looking at me like I'm an absolute moron, like I'm just looking at clouds. Um, and I had to frantically try and reassure them, no, no, there was a very rare, very large bird of prey, and they were like, mm, <laughs> no, I don't believe you. So yeah, I think it's finding rarities but also finding weird birds in, in weird locations that are also you know the really kind of memorable ones that, that stick out that's crazy i can't imagine seeing an osprey i always leave like, even any bird of prey in london like in central london they're usually a bird that you have to go out specifically to find mm -hmm. and to really kind of rural locations but at the time it was april so they were sort of migrating uh, back sort of to, to their usual sort of uh, breeding areas. So that's when you're likely to bump into them um, in weird places. Um, I just remembered another weird one. Now, this isn't a UK one, uh, but it's a, it's a British species. Um, I was at the top of, I can't remember what the name of the tower was, but it's this giant essentially replica of the Eiffel Tower in Prague. Um, climbed right to the top of it and I noticed some very small birds that were stuck behind the window. So I, you know, instinctively, bird nerd, thought, oh, I'm going to go and try and save them. I'll save the day, whatever these birds are. So they were flitting around. I grabbed one of them and then I looked at it and it was a firecrest, the smallest bird in Europe, which when it was held in my hand, I kid you not, it was lighter than a one pence piece. This is essentially a hummingbird. Um, and that was the first ever firecrest that I saw, and it was in my hands. Um, and I'm sat there in awe. This is one of the greatest birding moments of my entire life. And all these tourists are just looking around like, what's he doing? <laughs> Why has he got a bird? <laughs> man. Um, so yeah, that's sometimes the the sort of reaction that you get sometimes from the general public um, that sometimes they get it and sometimes they just think you're being a bit odd but you've got to take the rough with the smooth sometimes. I'd be with you with the excitement. I remember seeing firecrests down in Cornwall um, a couple of years ago and it was, it was very special. Yeah, not very easy to see because they are so small but uh, 
I, I still haven't seen one in the UK, so I don't technically know if I can tick that off my list. But uh, I, I can claim I've seen one. That counts. I don't think I've ever seen one. Yeah, they're very, 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 very rare. Mostly kind of, if there's harsh winters, then there tends to be some large numbers of them. Uh, but you've got to you've got to keep your ear out on, on other birders and and listen to the all the people who are in the know. Uh, sometimes yeah. it's just a case of uh, you know politely messaging someone saying hi, where is this thing? How, where can I find it? Um, <laughs> birders are lovely people, by the way. Um, we're all fantastic and lovely. Um, you shouldn't fear us. <laughs> Um, I spotted that you also do some volunteering with the RSPB. I do, sort of. Um, so I have volunteered with the RSPB uh, mm -hmm. at their Rain and Marshes Nature Reserve. I started doing that when I left uni in 2016. I'd done it up until March 2020, and then I think you might be able to guess perhaps why uh, it may have stopped. Um, no, it wasn't anything to do with Brexit. Uh, it may have, to, to, uh, may have been due to something else. Um, at the moment, I haven't had the chance to to resume it because life has just been a bit crazy since the last couple of years. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, so a so good, good sort of four years of, of working with them. Uh, so sort of basically every other weekend uh, working at the visitor centre uh, out in Raynham, lovely nature reserve um one of my favorites really bizarre location right next to the river thames you can see central london from down the thames uh it's next it's wedged in between a landfill site and uh the eurostar so <laughs> you get heaps of rubbish and really quick trains to france um as well as an internationally important wetland so it's a Bit of a weird combination, um, but no, it's a, a cracking nature reserve. Uh, things like bearded tits are seen uh, regularly. Um, there was a resident water rail that was there uh, for quite a long period of time, uh, and it's basically uh, London's closest RSPB reserve. So it is very, very popular. Um, with Londoners, it is very accessible to to get to. So. Uh, if anyone's never been to the Rain and Marshes, I definitely uh, recommend a visit. The cafe is also very nice. They do great cake. I've not been. Um, what sort of things did you do there when you were there? Well, most of it was um, sort of visitor experience, so to speak. So I was front of house um, welcoming uh, all of the people, um, giving insights into kind of what was about. Uh, things like that, uh, but also just general sort of ad hoc sites around the place. Um, I did also get a lot of time to actually do a bit of birding uh, whilst there. Um, seen an osprey there as well, uh, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Um, I was there when the first ever crane was seen on the reserve, which was incredibly rare, and I think the first record for a crane being spotted within Greater London, which was a, a weird thing to uh, have been there for. Um, I've also heard a quail, um, which it, it's, it's famously very impossible to see a quail because they always live in long grass. But I can say that I've heard one. Um, so that's a, a weird sort of claim to fame. Nice. Have you ever done bird ringing? I haven't, and I have always wanted to. Obviously, living in Norfolk, the BTO is based in Thetford in Norfolk, and I've always told myself that I really need to. I've done, I've, I've visited many bird ringing demonstrations. I remember one of my first that I went to was at Minsmere. I got to hold the black cap and release it. And I think, yeah, I was about seven or eight, and that was really exciting for little jack even though it was quite a quite a dreary day but um, no bird ringing i know a lot of people that do uh, bird ringing it is so uh, exciting to kind of know all the different you know 
the science, the scientific outcomes that are coming from bird ringing. But yeah, I know I know um, one person that I, I follow on Instagram is also doing bird ringing in Gibraltar at the moment uh, and picking up some real rarities. So I'm incredibly jealous uh, of all the weird stuff that's uh, popping up there. But uh, it's definitely something I'm going to do bird ringing when I have a lot more time. But sadly, at the moment, um, I probably don't have that much time, sadly. That's fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> I've done it a couple of times just with like university, things like that. And yeah, it is really nice. What was the most difficult bird to ring? Oh, I've I've I literally only ringed like maybe a blue tit and a robin. So pretty limited um, with what I've done. Ah. But yeah, I don't know. I imagine the bigger the bird, the harder it is. No, I've, I've heard that. Like, I see people ringing sparrowhawks and I just think, no, not today. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll do like the little cute one, <laughs> you know, a, a long tailed tit, like, uh, like, who could be hurt by a long-tailed tit? They're adorable, yeah. surely. I've never done bird ringing. What do they feel like, birds, like when you're holding them? I've never held a bird. It's 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 weird because they, they are so small, If obviously if it's a small bird. But yeah, you can just feel the heartbeat fluttering away in your hand. It's a very unique experience. So yeah, if you ever get the chance to do it, do it. Birds are much lighter than you think, is also what I would say. Yeah. They are essentially just bits of skin with feathers, and you kind of think that there should be some weight to them. Um, whereas something like a, you know, warbler or a finch, yeah, they weigh practically nothing. And it's worth pointing out that you do need a license to ring birds. So if you're doing that it, is be, correct. you'd be going out with someone who's got a license. Um, but yeah, if you see an opportunity, take it. <laughs> Please ring responsibly, guys. Yeah. Please ring responsibly. <laughs> Do you have a favourite place to go birding? Oh, do I have a favourite place? Um, Minsmere in Suffolk is probably uh, the one I think it's generally well regarded as one of the best nature reserves um, in the UK. Um, I did my dissertation uh, on Minsmere, um, which was incredibly exciting, whilst every other person in my uh, degree was uh, doing much more sort of exciting projects such as uh, river dolphins in uh, the Amazon, uh, caimans, uh, one person was monitoring uh, camera traps for large uh, carnivores in Botswana, uh, one guy was researching lemurs in Madagascar, and they turned to me and they said, Jack, what are you doing? I was like, I'm doing ducks in Suffolk, hope that's all right. Um, <laughs> So it, it didn't quite have the same resonance with the rest of my class, but I still thought that bar-tailed godwits should be equally as important as, you know, eye eyes and, you know, red squirrels, but uh, who knows? But um, yeah, Minsmere um, is a place that's really close to my heart. Um, Raynham as well, obviously, it's probably the closest big um nature reserve to me um at the moment i live in in essex so i quite like going along the thames estuary uh, we get thousands of brent geese over the winter uh, basically just milling around in the mud uh, whilst people walk their dogs right next to them not realizing that this is a bird that's probably flown three thousand miles uh, just to you know sit next to you it's kind of just like oh it's a duck it's like no it's not not a duck. Um, I, I, I have so many battles with the general public, especially my favourite is when I'm along a river or a canal or something and there's a coop swimming past, there's a small child that points at it and says, mummy, look at that duck. And mummy says, yes, it's a duck. Well done. And I kind of want to internally scream and turn them aside and say no 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 he is a member of the rail family he's related to a corn crake please come back um but yes anywhere where there's birds is where i enjoy going really um you know you don't often need to make a day of it and plan um if you just go out somewhere where there's trees somewhere where there's green space somewhere where there's water you'll always find something if you look hard enough mm -hmm. Definitely. Even just like in your garden, you can find birds. 
Oh, definitely, definitely. Today, I had a pair of collared doves um, visit me, and they always turn up in pairs. It's never just one. They're always a little crew together feeding, uh, um, which I always find quite adorable. Um, but uh, much love for the doves. <laughs> Is there a bird that you'd like to see that you haven't seen yet that's, like, on your list? I tell you what, I, I have a mental list. I don't have a physical list. And the animal that is top of my list is an otter, um, <laughs> which I don't think that technically counts. Um, I, I essentially grew up in the best place in the UK to see otters, which is the Waveney Valley between... Uh, Norfolk and Suffolk. So I should have been tripping over otters. I grew up fairly near an otter trust nature reserve that had to close down because they were too good at conserving otters. There was too many of them. They'd done such a good job. So how I haven't seen one is beyond me. Um, in, in the city centre of my hometown, Norwich, there are otters regularly right in the city centre. Again, still not seeing one. Uh, so that has irked me and they've avoided me several times. I've been to nature reserves where they've said, oh, there will definitely be otters. And I've sat there for hours freezing until my fingers feel like they're going to fall off with no otters. Um, so yes, that and badgers as well. I've oddly never seen a badger. I know lots of people have lots of great stories of going badger watching. They just don't like Norfolk. The soil is too light for them, uh, um, so I'm told. Um, but bird-wise, probably a white-tailed sea eagle or a golden eagle. I'm a sucker for the big, you know, star bird, so to speak. I mean, there are probably little rare warblers that I've never seen before. But come on, they don't they don't compare to what's referred to as a flying barn door um, with this reintroduction program on the Isle of Wight for white-tailed sea eagles. I hope that the south of England will become a new stronghold for these birds. But um, I live in hope because uh, I still haven't seen one. But when I do, I will probably gasp and maybe faint. But um, yeah, that's top of my bird list, so to speak. I'm probably going to annoy you now, but I've seen otters and white-tailed sea eagles all in one holiday. Um, I think I mentioned it on the podcast before, but I took a trip to the Isle of Skye, a family holiday, a couple of years ago. Um, and the place where we were staying, it's just like a little um, lodge, I guess, by the lock. One morning, otters were just swimming in the, the lock. They they climbed out of the water right in front of us and ate some food. I barely had to do anything, just woke up. And there they were. That was very special. And then obviously Isle of Sky, there's loads of white-tailed sea eagles. Just see them flying around. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm very happy for you, but also internally in great pain. <laughs> I have before Googled how long it would take to get to the Isle of Mull, which is obviously the other big sort of touristy island in the Outer Hebrides. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to spend a week. I'm going to go up to Scotland. I'm going to explore. I'm going to have a great time. Ten, 10 hours by train, 10 hours, and it costs basically a mortgage to get up there all on my own. And so I thought against it. I think I'll just maybe hope that one will accidentally, you know, land in my garden. I, I can live in hope. I can live in hope. No, no, it might happen. And an otter, if you like, have a flood or something in your garden, you could find an otter there. Now, there's an idea. We could have an otter attacking a white-tailed sea eagle <laughs> and then mid-fight land in my garden. Yeah. All while a golden eagle is there refereeing. Perfect. Uh -huh. Perfect. Definitely going to happen. I've not seen any of them either, so you're not alone there. Oh, good. Oh, good. I don't feel quite so bad. <laughs> What about outside of the UK? Do you have a favourite bird species you can't see in the UK? Ooh, that's an interesting one. I always remember seeing greater flamingos for the first time in Spain. Um, we were basically just flying, well, we were driving to Alicante Airport past a salt pan, and there was 
tens of thousands of them. And whilst I'm ogling at these fantastic birds, again, everyone in the car with me was just like, yeah, you can just see them at the zoo. I was like, yeah, but they're, they're wild, they're proper, they're not like plastic ones that someone's forked into their lawn. You know, these are real, proper flamingos. Um, I'd say the other one was an incredibly rare bird, which I saw when I went on holiday to Malaga recently, uh, which is a white-headed duck, um, which is an internationally endangered species. Um, if I think it's on IUCN, uh, I think they do rank it as endangered. Um, and they said that this nature reserve just south of Malaga, it's probably the best place in Europe to see this incredibly rare duck. And I turn up and I sort of think I could be here for hours. I, I you know, really need to be on my wits end to, to be very patient, to be very careful, but also to set my expectations that I probably wasn't going to see it. I rocked up to this hide and they were right there, just sat right in front of it, didn't have to wait. They were just happy as Larry. And I kind of just thought, well, this is, you know, easily, you know, the easiest rare bird that I've ever seen, apart from the firecrest, which I picked up. But so, yes, white-headed ducks, I'm afraid we'll probably never find in the UK because they are so, so rare. Um, it's debatable as to whether we'll see them in Spain anymore. Um, so that was a really kind of niche, weird bird um, to find on my holidays. Was there anyone there that had been waiting for hours to see them and then they turned up and then you just rocked up and you were there? I kid you not, no one else was at the nature reserve. Oh. This is a massive, huge nature reserve with incredibly rare species, uh, things like black winged stilts, which are incredibly rare in the UK. Um, loads of avocets, uh, saw an osprey there as well. There's a continuing theme here. Um, but yeah, I went uh, pretty early in the morning. Uh, it's not like a UK nature reserve where there's a nice visitor center with someone greeting you. It was essentially a bit of land with a fence and you just walk straight through. There was a few joggers um, and I'm sat here looking at one of the most endangered birds in Europe and thinking, why is no one else, you know, why are there not cues, you know, to see this bird? Or is it just me? Um, so, yeah, um, I don't know if the culture in Spain towards bird life is a, is a bit different. Um, but um, I got the whole hide to myself and essentially the whole nature reserve to myself. So that was a massive win. Nice. That's kind of cool for you. Like a cool experience. <laughs> We noticed you also have a blog. Could you give us a bit of an overview on that? So I would describe my blog as essentially BuzzFeed towards wildlife. A lot of people have sort of very scientific blogs and very sort of in-depth spiritual blogs. For me, it's more about writing about wildlife experiences, writing about my own sort of wildlife opinions. Um, and again, it was a bit of a lockdown hobby. Um, I was going a bit bored on furlough, uh, had a lot of ideas, and I thought I would just try and uh, put some ideas into virtual form. Um, I've tried to sort of create it myself. Um, yeah, it, it, it's something that I've, I'm still working on regularly. It's still a real sort of passion project of mine. So yeah, it, it, it's just me nattering about birds, basically. Um, my weird quirk and my weird approach to writing is that I famously hate reading. Um, I don't, a lot of people have a book on the go. Um, I cannot think of anything worse than having to sit down and read a book. And that's my own opinion. I'm sure lots of people really enjoy having something to, something literary to chew on. Uh, um, I just don't think my brain is suited to books. Um, my blog is mostly just my own thoughts, really. Uh, it's whatever. Um, it's essentially a, a conversation in written form. Uh, and yeah, it's a collection of, of stories, uh, opinions, uh, rants sometimes, because rants sometimes need to be had. But yeah, it's a, 
nice little side project for me. I feel like I go through phases with with Weary Den. Like sometimes I'll read like two books in I don't know like a week, and then I go months without reading and just have no interest in that. I feel like with writing, I feel like I need to be in the mood, and I feel like I need to have a good idea as well. There are some I will go months on end without writing anything, and then I'll write three blogs in a week. Um, things ideas will just come to me. Um, like earlier this summer when. Lo- of Ireland started, I thought to myself, what if British birds went on Love Island? Like, how would British birds' personalities work on Love Island? And I basically said, like, you know, swans would be a great couple. You know, they would be there and they would be loyal throughout, um, whereas someone like a Dunnock would be there for the for the laughs. They'd be there for the cameras. Um, they're definitely not someone to, you know, get into a relationship really quickly. They will break up with you and it will be horrendous. So don't trust a Dunnock. I'm sorry if there are any Dunnocks listening, um, but you guys need to sort yourselves out. Like, <laughs> Do you have any more birds for Love Island? You're going to have to read the blog. I'm going to be cheeky okay. here. You yeah. have to read the blog. That, yeah. Can't spoil it too much. Um, so it's, in my, uh, it's in my Instagram bio, guys. Uh, Jack Birdbrain, subtle plug. Yeah, leave you, leave you guys hanging. You have to, have to, you, unlike me, you have to do some reading. Sorry. <laughs> you mentioned you do some photography as well. Do you have a favourite thing to take pictures of? I, I like taking pictures of wildlife in my garden because I don't have to travel very far. I don't have to pay for a bus fare and I don't have to pay for someone else's cake. Um, I can just make some at home. Um, I really liked photographing barn owls, but mostly because when I used to live in Norfolk, they nested in a tree in my garden. Uh, So they would essentially land on the fence opposite my bedroom window. So I was probably lucky enough to have some of the best views of barn owls that probably anyone in the UK has ever seen. You know, bird watchers will tell you up and down the country, barn owls are really shy, timid creatures. They don't like human disturbance. They're, you know, very difficult to find. Um, they're very crepuscular, so they only come out at the evening and the morning. So very, very, very sort of temperamental bird to find. Whereas these barn owls that live next to me were pretty consistent and it was unbelievable to be able to not only see them, but also get some cracking photographs of them. Um, and some of them, you know, some of the, my favourite photographs that I've ever taken. So is it any, you know, surprise that barn owls are my favourite? Uh, I'm, I will stop going on about barn owls, I promise. <laughs> Do you have any tips for someone wanting to get into wildlife photography? I imagine with birds quite hard when they're in flights especially um yeah any advice i've never quite hacked doing birds in flight i've tried i think birds in flight is a lot of luck and a lot of clicking um i think wildlife photography it is unfortunate in the sense of people who are very good at wildlife photography have a lot of money and they have a lot of time So I feel like there's a lot of pressure from people who perhaps don't have so much money uh, and, and, you know, not the time of the day when they're working to actually be able to go out to really kind of exciting places and do things. But for myself, I don't have a lot of money and I don't have a lot of time either, but I don't know how I manage it. For wildlife photography for a complete beginner, I would still try and fork out and invest in a decent camera. There's plenty of of photographers out there on Instagram and different platforms that you can speak to that can recommend decent cameras, decent lenses, um, all on a budget. Um, But I think photography itself, I think it's a case of knowing a good location and kind of knowing, you know, what you want to photograph sometimes. Some of the things that I photographed have been complete chance, whereas, you know, there have been times where I've gone to a nature reserve, 
specifically looking for one species in, in particular. And really much like photography and birding, it's the golden P word, patience. I think if you lack patience, then you're not going to get anywhere. Wildlife doesn't wait for you. You have to go and put in the effort for wildlife. Sometimes it's unrewarding. The way that I often describe birding and photography is a bit like football in the sense of you could go to an away game, you could lose 5 nil, and it's pouring down with rain and you feel terrible, or you could go to a stadium that you're not expecting to win, scrape a one nil, and it'd be absolutely surprising and wonderful. Sometimes you just can't, you know, predict what's going to happen. So I would say just make the most of, of, of going outdoors and just enjoy sort of every experience that you have in nature, because no day is the same. You will see something different. The weather will be different. So yeah enjoy the great outdoors absolutely um i most people now have quite decent cameras on their phones they probably won't be very good for birds but i suppose if you want to get started you could do insects invertebrates plants that sort of thing quite easily just so you get the hang of just looking for things when you're out and about oh definitely definitely yeah um i mean in terms of just getting into sort of birding in general my you know, first piece of advice would be just go into your garden uh, with birds. Uh, garden birds tend to be the most recognisable. They tend to be um, the most kind of bold coloured and also the most, you know, well known, you know, your, your robins, your great tits, your chaffinches, etc, etc. Um, I feel like there's a lot of, how should I put it? a lot of feeling towards birders like if you're getting started that you kind of you feel a bit left out and you kind of experience birders are uh, uh, sort of a bit intimidating i think starting birding is just a case of it in enjoying what you're seeing you don't have to know everything not every birder knows everything you don't need to know every bird book cover to cover you shouldn't feel ashamed if you you know if one of your friends can identify uh, a velvet scoter and you can't it is simply just if you go out and enjoy the fresh air enjoy the trees enjoy the sounds the smells of nature i feel like that is the most crucial part of it really 100 percent agree yeah, I agree with that as well. I definitely think that you have to be patient with nature. The amount of times I've wanted to get a photo of a specific butterfly, because it's so hard to get pictures of them in flight. I just end up chasing them until they land. <laughs> I feel like you can't really do that with birds. No, what you should do is get a net, catch them, and then put them in a jar. <laughs> I'm joking. Please do not. Don't do that. <laughs> there are plenty of butterflies. You have, you have to just wait for them to land. It's often good to figure out what plants are their favourite plants mm -hmm. um, and then maybe try and find them and then wait for the butterflies to come. I'm not a lepidopterist. I'm solely an ornithologist, sadly. So um, you guys will have to speak to a butterfly expert on that one. You were published in the Connections with Nature book which is really exciting. Could you tell us a, a bit about this book, perhaps, for those who haven't read it or seen it? Yeah, so it was a project that came about in relation to the blog that I started. I joined uh, the Wildlife Blogger Crowd, uh, which was a collaborative group of uh, wildlife bloggers uh, on Instagram. I'd obviously started writing my own content through the blog, uh, saw an opportunity and said, hi, do you want to write a a short story and be published in a book. Um, would you like to do it? I sort of thought on a whim, why not? There's nothing wrong, There's, you know, nothing wrong with me just writing something. Um, so I wrote it, submitted it, and then heard nothing probably for about four or five months. Uh, and then all of a sudden, that thing that I wrote was in an actual physical book that was being sold in bookshops. Um, and I actually had a physical copy of it 
with like my actual words in a real book and it was just a bit um surreal really my short story was about barn owls i promised i wouldn't mention them again um but can you can you tell why they're my favorite i just like them an awful lot and of course i cannot tell you anything more about the story because you have to go and buy the book I cannot, uh, well, I, I could, I could tell you the entire story. I could read it out now, but um, no, that wouldn't be fair. But it was, it was a great experience to actually have it published. It was only when the wildlife blogger crowd um, posted on their socials that um, they'd sent a coffee to David Attenborough with a letter back handwritten to say he'd read it and enjoyed it. At that point, I screamed like a small girl. Um, I just knowing that David Attenborough may or may not have laid eyes on a piece of content that I have written. That was pretty exciting. So yeah, it was me in amongst 50 other like minded naturey people. It's not all about birds. It's all about people's connections. Um, with nature. It's not just short stories, there's poems, I think there's a song in there as well. So yeah, it's a, it's a cracking book, if that's uh, enough to sell it to you guys. You can also, I believe, I think this is right, you can buy a copy, and if you buy it for an extra three pounds, a copy also gets sent to a school in Kenya. I think that's that offer is still uh, available. And that was also surreal. Um, because there was pictures of children in a school in Kenya um, actually reading the book and reading my story, which was real wholesome. And if anything, the very point of, of what I was trying to do, you know, educate people, spread the love about nature. That's the vibe, you know? Yeah, that sounds good. I'll have a look, check it out. <laughs> no, I need to, I've been meaning, I've seen it around for like ages. And I just haven't got round to buying one and reading it yet. And I don't know why. It's just one of those things that's always in the back of my mind. I'm like, oh, I need to do that. You can put it on your Christmas list. Or oh, anyone listening, you can also put oh. it on your Christmas list. That's a good uh, idea. It is nearly Christmas. Yeah, buy it for your family. Buy it in bulk. Um, <laughs> I can't I can't get you any cheap copies, but I can autograph them if you'd like. It maybe make, oh. It'll make them maybe more valuable. Maybe like buy like 20 pence, but we'll see. <laughs> So you've touched on this already, but do you have any advice for someone wanting to get into birding? Maybe how to find the best places to visit or tips on learning the IDs of birds, things like that? Yeah, so like I said, if, if garden birds, if you have a garden, feed the birds in your garden because the most common, the most um, noticeable birds will uh, visit. If you don't have a garden, you can, you can get window feeders. If you don't have a window, you should probably get a house with a window. But you can go to a local park, um, local woods, um, anywhere that's vaguely green and natural, there will be bird life aplenty. Um, there are decent bird ID books out there. There's also plenty of online uh, content apps um, as well. There are apps where you can uh, record the sound of a bird and it will identify them. I know this is where technology has gone. It's nuts. But I would also say just be collaborative about getting into nature. Bring a friend along. It's, it's no fun doing it all on your own. You know, if you're young and you want to drag your parents to drive you to a nature reserve, that's what I did and it worked. Um, I really just try and pester your friends. Is, is the tactic which I have tried for many years to varying results. Some of them um, tolerate it. Some of them are very clear in the sense that uh, they're not interested. Um, but I think the takeaway, if you're going to try and convince your friends, is that it's a walk in nature and people love walks. They just don't necessarily like identifying different types of trees and whether that was a wren or a dunnock or not. But um, yeah, there's lots of, of resources out there. Birders are really friendly people, and there's no such thing as a stupid question in birding. If you have seen something that you're really not sure what it is, just message someone that you think might know the answer. We will tell you, and we won't shame you. There's not 
a vendetta against non-birders. If anything, birders want more people to be interested. What we want, we want to broaden everyone's understanding, broaden everyone's education of um, birding. Because being a birder is multifaceted. We're meteorologists, because we're checking the weather all the time. We're environmentalists, because you know we care about the, the state of biodiversity. You know, it, it, we're, we're biologists, essentially, um, to varying level of, of scientific understanding. So what we want to do um, is improve conservation. Um, but ultimately, that comes down to, to education. So, yeah, what we really want is for everyone to love birds. But then all the nature reserves would be quite busy and that would be a pickle. So it's a balance. Yeah, I've definitely um, experienced people being really kind and like telling me what a bird is without thinking I'm stupid or whatever because I don't really bird ID is one of my worst skills I think and like I'll just message people or put something on my Instagram being like what's this bird and then I get loads of replies like oh it's this and it's like not judgmental there's no shame in that because you then learned what that thing is and you then mm -hmm. know it for future time so when someone else asks you you can be the clever clogs so you could be like yeah that's a parrot cross bill <laughs> <laughs> not that i'd be able to id one because they're very difficult to id but there we go <laughs> do you know some of the best ways to attract birds to your garden like any advice for people number one water more than anything people think food first no water first that is the most important part um food then obviously comes second but also making sure that there's shelter for wildlife um in my garden unfortunately there's not a great deal of of shelter um for birds it is quite difficult um if i could plant 10 different trees in my garden and maybe i'd be making a bit of progress if you have any pets like cats or dogs try and limit them going outside and maybe put a bell on your cat that's probably the best way to to help your birds but yeah um aside from you know essentially building a full-scale wetland in your garden putting out some feeders will do as well oh imagine if you could do that though just build a whole habitat <laughs> oh yeah some reed beds oh a dragonfly pool an actual mountain with capricaly <laughs> oh dream yeah. absolute dream <laughs> so here on nature positivity we like to end our episodes with our nature highlights of the week jack let's hear yours do you have a nature highlight of the week Oh, I've been inside all of this week. I've been quite boring, um, but I did go to my shed. Um, I saw an absolutely massive spider. Um, I'm not very good with arachnids, but I've been told um, this thing was a garden cross spider, which apparently is quite exciting. Um, it's about the size of a 50 pence piece, and it was guarding the door to my shed. So I kind of I felt like it was a bit like the Forbidden Forest in Harry Potter. I worried that Aragog would be snuggled up with my lawnmower. Um, but um, I gently moved him out of the way because uh, my pigeons needed their food. But um, yeah, that's my, that's the most nature that I've had this week, sadly. <laughs> I've not been that productive nature-wise. No, I love that your nature highlight was a spider, though, considering so many people just hate them. Surprisingly, it's not a bird and it's not a barn owl either. Real surprise. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Holly, what about you? Do you have a nature highlight? I do. So the past week we've, well, we always get wood pigeons in our garden, but we've kind of named the wood pigeon Craig. And each day we, we just look for Craig in the garden. <laughs> Is Craig here yet? <laughs> and he sometimes, or she, um, invites a friend along. It's just been a bit of a running joke in the household. <laughs> Craig the wood pigeon. How do you know that it's Craig and not just like another one? We don't. Yeah, we don't. It could be, could be a, a load of different... Um... It could be Darren the wood pigeon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Craig could have just been there once and then it could be, you know, Darren and then Rosie and I don't know. But yeah, 
we kept recording it, Craig. <laughs> like, I really hope that Craig finds a Cynthia and you can have little Craigs. Yeah. But <laughs> that would wouldn't be that lovely. just be so wholesome? That would be <laughs> a future nature highlight. Craig yeah. and Cynthia. <laughs> a year from now, sir, remember that Craig I told you all about? Well, he has children. Oh, <laughs> that would be we, cool. could all, we could all set up his wedding. It would just be glorious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sounds good. Planned. What about you, Karis? Uh Mine was unintentional. So I was driving back. Well, I wasn't driving. I was in the passenger seat. But we were coming back from a wedding. And I look up in the sky and there are some birds of prey, which was pretty cool. I don't know if there were buzzards or red kites. I don't know the difference, to be honest. But there was two of them and it was really cool. And... Yeah, that's my highlight. <laughs> I've not been outside too much. Were they were they really big or were they fairly big? <laughs> that's a weird question. I'll, I'll ask a second question. Did they have a forked tail or a round tail? I think it was more round, so does that mean they were buzzard? That probably means they were buzzards. Um, mm-hmm. But red, red kites are uh, increasing in numbers. Uh, Again, another bird when I was a very small child that if you'd said to me I'd see them in Norfolk, I'd bite your hand off. Um, <laughs> I've, I've subsequently got to bite a lot of hands, um, which could be quite laborious. Uh, but yeah, they're really common. But I've seen them in my garden, not in my garden, but from my garden um, in Essex. So cracking bird, cracking bird, easily in my top 10. Nice. My cup of tea has all gone, which must mean it's the end of the episode. Thank you so much, Jack, for chatting with us today about your amazing work. We'll put Jack's social media information in the description of this episode if you want to check it out. Amazing. Thanks for having me on. Don't forget to follow us on social media and you can find the details in the description of this episode and keep an eye out for our next episode. Thanks again, Jack, for joining us today and thank you for listening to Nature Positivity.